ladies and gentlemen, we don't have, you know, the sound system, but I guess, you know, Sounds we could good. hear each other. Yeah, we can hear. So, no problem. We're going to start. Probably uh, other folks will join us. And uh, we are on Zoom. It looks like people can't get away from Zoom. <laughs> Even though we're trying to, you know, bring everybody back to uh, in person. My name is Eric Agnero. I work for the Vermont International, I mean, uh, Community and International Involvement, Vicky, Vermont Institute, of course. Uh, I'm part of, uh, as a representative of this institute, part of uh, a group of institutions. And, and organizations that uh, join every year uh, around the celebration of Africa Day to, uh, to commemorate the uh, creation the, of the organization of African unity, which has become now uh, uh, the African Union. But also to look at what has been achieved all these years and this year, on behalf then of Towards Freedom, which is one of our main leader group in this coalition, the Caroline Fund, and of course Vicky, the Association of African Living in Vermont, and uh, other groups that have uh, supported us all these years. This is the third edition of Africa Day Burlington. And uh, I would like to say a good thank you to Robin Lloyd from Towards Freedom. Robin, who has fight for peace and international justice has no limit. I would like to uh, salute a camera. That's how she likes me to uh, <laughs> consider Sandy Baird. Sandy Baird, you know, a lawyer, an historian, a fighter whose uh, you know, determination has had like, many results, not only for all the women that you know, support this community more than the men, but also for all the you know, citizens of Vermont and beyond. I would like also to uh, say uh, thank you to Kurt Mehta, who is a, a very good friend of our institute and these groups. Kurt Mehta is a lawyer, is a political analyst, is a scholar and he's always been uh, there when we needed him to comment, you know, uh, uh, l'actualité mondiale. Uh, without further ado, I would like to quickly introduce my friend, brother, and also a scholar that we respect very much within the Ivorian American community, Dr. Nyaka Lagoke. We came to the US almost in the same period the Clinton years, you know, with a lot of exuberance, joie, and then uh, uh, Nyaka went into academia and then had a successful career that today is uh, at the center of this uh, meeting. This book that he wrote about a crisis that uh, has shaken uh, the Ivory Coast, our country. I was there as a reporter for uh, uh, CNN. I saw everything. I saw the involvement of the US, how the CIA even gave some uh, you know, incapacitating gas to reduce the, re uh, you know, the, the resistance of those who didn't want uh, someone to be placed as a president by uh, the IMF, by uh, the world uh, Western powers. And then, but also uh, the, uh, the crisis was uh, followed by uh, the indictment by the International Criminal Court of the president that didn't want to leave power because he thought he didn't lose the, the election. So without further ado, I would like to introduce here uh, uh, Dr. Nyaka Lagoke, who's presenting his new book, Laurent Gbagbo's Trial. Laurent Gbagbo was the former president of Ivory Coast who went to uh, Hagen. Uh, and the indictment of the International Criminal Court, a Pan-African victory. This is Dr. Nyaka Lagoke, who's uh, said a word of an introduction, yes, or we'll go straight to uh, You have to say something? Yes, say something. No, we can go straight to it. Yeah, as uh, Eric mentioned, my name is Sandy Baird. I'm very pleased on, the, on behalf of the Vermont Institute. Uh, I'm pleased to be here with Eric and Nyaka Lagoke, right? Um, who has, his, his most recent book is on the International 
criminal court, which is a court that was set up many years ago, and Kurt actually was a part of it, right, when it was first set up? When it was first set up, yeah. Yeah, when you, you were working at the UN? I was so. working at the United Nations in Austria at that time. Okay, and so our speaker today has this book that has recently come out about the criminal court. I'm providing a history of that court, its purposes, its objectives, but also the curious fact that most of the indictments and most of the prosecutions have been against Africans, is that correct? So we want to uh, introduce that subject, the court itself, and its uh, rather troubled practices. Um, and Kurt also will comment on that as well, I hope. Okay? So. Anyway, Kurt, why don't you talk a little bit about your involvement? Okay. Kurt, Kurt is a colleague of mine. He's an attorney. As uh, Eric mentioned, he's a scholar um, and a historian himself. We've done many programs together, and he uh, is very insightful about, particularly about the problems and the practices in the developing world. Kurt was born in India, wasn't there very long, but has um, very deep knowledge about India, Pakistan, and also the whole developing world. So Kurt, why don't you tell us a little bit about your history with the uh, international uh, court? Sure. Yeah, so. I'm just going to limit what I say to the topic that Dr. Lauren is going to speak about. Nyaka. OK, Nyaka. OK. Lorraine is the one who Oh, OK. Yeah. Right, right. I don't want to go to jail. That's right, right. <laughs> Uh, so what we, uh, I, in the 1990s, in the mid-1990s, I worked at the United Nations uh, office in Vienna, Austria. There's a branch there along with the one people may know about in, in Switzerland and then the big headquarters in, in New York City. Uh, the, uh, I worked at the Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice branch. Uh, our main focus was to uh, go into post-conflict regions uh, that essentially lost their legal system, either through expulsions, through killings, and through just total breakdowns of society. And we would go in and provide counsel to people who were previously attorneys, judges, and in law enforcement to try to recreate their legal systems from the ground up, taking into account those countries' cultures, histories, and, uh, and then also trying to uh, make sure that human rights were respected. Uh, as far as human rights could be agreed upon, what the version could be, <laughs> excuse me, in that local country to what we may think of uh, human rights in the West. So that was what my, my uh, department essentially worked with. And at that, at that department, we had a number of uh, more senior attorneys than me who were uh, trying to put together a, a permanent international criminal court. For folks that may know a little bit about history going back, most international tribunals in the past, before the creation of the ICC, uh, were essentially ad hoc committees. Uh, if we want to go back to you know, talking about the Nuremberg trials, uh, to even the conviction of Slobodan Milosevic of Serbia for war crimes committed during the Yugoslavia Wars in the 1990s. These were all ad hoc communities. So a couple of people at the branch at the United Nations that I worked with, as well as other well-minded people were try and well-meaning people, were trying to put together a more permanent tribunal which would prosecute and try uh, individuals that had been uh, suspected of or accused of committing war crimes, crimes against humanity. Uh, and because there was no forum like that uh, in the past, except for these ad hoc communities like Nuremberg and uh, the uh, Yugoslavia trials that took place and the trials that took place with re respect to the uh, awful genocide in Rwanda in the 1990s. So that's a little bit about my background, uh, you know, and then, then I came back to the States after that. So without further ado. So I, uh, I just want uh, to thank you. Today I uh, 
I, uh, the PowerPoint is too short. I wanted to, I did not want to add any more slides. Uh, by the way, when I presented this PowerPoint, I was supposed to present this PowerPoint in my school. I was given only three minutes. Uh, so, I, so it's a very short one. I thank again uh, Robin. Uh, you know, sometimes in life there are people you're supposed to meet at a particular moment. You are definitely that person I was supposed to meet at this very moment, so I'm, I'm grateful to you. Grateful to my friend uh, Eric, uh, grateful to Sandy, and uh, God, as God knows what he's doing. So Kurt, thank you so much for your brief presentation. And uh, there are people like him, uh, beautiful souls who believed in true justice. And then that's why when I talk about the ICC, I do not generalize, you know, to attack everyone, you understand? But uh, even though people like you have worked on the tool because of some external forces, uh, the way justice was supposed to be delivered, uh, it was not what people like you worked for. So that is uh, what I'm going to talk about, and I thank you, all of you. Uh, Megan, nice to see you again, and Yisha, that's your name, nice to see you again. Thank you so much. So, uh, the, the, what we need to know, this is the International Criminal Court, the logo, can, anyone can find online. Uh, it is based uh, in The Hague, in Netherlands, and a beautiful uh, building. I had the opportunity to meet some people there. Uh, the, there is a treaty uh, that was adopted, signed, ratified by many countries. This is how uh, the International Criminal Court uh, could, be, uh, could start its activities. Uh, when we see the court of uh, more than 100 members, and then uh, um, uh, many countries in Africa have uh, uh, ratified uh, the Treaty of Rome, uh, which was signed in 1998. And I think the court started functioning in 2002. So as you remember, 2002, one year after the establishment of uh, the International Criminal Court, uh, there was the war in Iraq. And then the International Criminal Court did not move. And then even though uh, the war in Iraq uh, was fought over a lie, because uh, the United States said that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, and later on, we realized that Colin Powell was in the UN, and it was not true. But uh, hundreds of thousands of people were killed, and people started questioning the rationale of the International Criminal Court. As I want to go very fast, and then this is how I, I plan this conversation, I want us to have a very interactive conversation, and glad uh, there are two great lawyers here, and then uh, we will have that conversation. So when you look at, this fa when you look at the faces over there, on the screen, uh, most of the people that you see over there, uh, oh, you have all, all, more than 40, all of them indicted, prosecuted, condemned. Most of them are from Africa. How can you say that you are uh, doing justice and then the faces of the prosecuted or the accused are faces from Africa? And we know the history of Africa, uh, the, from slavery to colonialism, and then people like me, we started questioning. Uh, some people were saying, if, uh, they were asking if the ICC was not a racist uh, international criminal court. So there are many people, of course, those who supported the ICC wrote many books. And then, but there are two people here, uh, and both of them are white. One is uh, David Oyle from England. I had the privilege to meet with him in 2016 uh, in Ghana at a conference organized by the ICC, by the ICC uh, or endorsed by the ICC. And the other one, her name is Stephanie Maupas, and she wrote a nice book in French, uh, Le Grand Roman de la Coupe Penale Internationale de Justice. So, so those two, if you have the opportunity to read at least the book in English, uh, David Oyle published a 600-page book, more than 2,000 footnotes, so that you can see that the guy was serious. So I was greatly inspired by these two books and some other ones uh, to write my own. 
People may think because I'm black African, then I may be biased. No, I love to talk about facts, and then I was inspired by those two books and some other ones. So in the case of Africa, why when Babu was taken to prison uh, after the electoral crisis, I don't want to take too much time to talk about the crisis. If you'd want to know, there were five features, uh, ethnicity, violence, neocolonialism, uh, pan-Africanism, and there, there is another one that I forgot. So we have time, we can go into the details, but just know two camps were fighting. Uh, Babu was in power. Mr. Ouattara, the current president, raised the rebellion, attacked the country, divided the country for eight years. His rebels were controlling the northern part of the country. When there was the electoral stalemate in 2010, 2011, the war resumed and the United Nations and France forces, in the name of democracy, in the name of a humanitarian intervention, supported the rebels and defeated the forces loyal to the, the former president. That is the background. And now defeated, like uh, in Nuremberg, you spoke about Nuremberg, the defeated were taken, and he was taken to a trial, first in the northern part, it was there, and then they called the country, and they took him to the Hague. And now people like us, we say, you know what? If you want to do justice, do justice. You're not going to go and, and then I go after one camp. And that was my argument and the argument of many people in Africa. But the faces that you see on the, on the, on the screen, uh, that, uh, yesterday I did not want to show a PowerPoint, just the faces uh, are the people who represent the leadership of Africa. We do not have time to talk about each one of them. Uh, you may recognize uh, Malcolm X next to Kwame Nkrumah in the middle. Uh, you may recognize on the left in the middle, Patus Domumba. Uh, the bottom column, you have Dr. King there. So if you, were, if you were a black leader from 1958 to 1968, you were either sent to jail, ostracized, el eliminated, or killed. Nkrumah, who was the, uh, great, who was the champion of Pan-Africanism, was overthrown February uh, 24, 1966. So when the Europeans come and they talk about justice, or oh, beautiful souls like Kirk, when they come and say, oh, you know, we need to do justice, and so, so, and so, and all of a sudden, all the faces of the people who are that black people, our, our collective, historical collective memory is about slavery, colonialism, neocolonialism, and we see the International Criminal Court incapable of doing true justice as a tool in the hands of the colonial, of the colonial and imperial forces. Or this, because of this, Africans mobilized and they decided that they were going to fight for Babu to be free. Spent eight years in The Hague in prison. Thirteen times they denied him a bailout. Thirteen times. And then the trial took place after years. And finally they realized that he was not guilty. And then he was freed. And uh, as I was talking about uh, Kwame Nkrumah, there is one thing Kwame Nkrumah said many, many years ago. The forces arrayed against us are, and I use the word most carefully, formidable. They operate in a worldwide combination at all levels, uh, political, economic, military, cultural, and so, so, and so, and even at the level of information services. I put together this. Uh, Megan, this is what I wanted you to see. This is what I call the wheel of imperialism. And then somewhere uh, you can see that the last to be created was going to be that court in the field of, uh, in the judicial field. And all those institutions that you see over there are activated or they self-activate themselves when the Western world thinks that it has to pursue an agenda to, ass to assert, exert, and express uh, the rule that they put together for the last 500 years. And uh, so this is what I do. And uh, here, uh, during Bagos trial, people use different ways to fight. Uh, they said that they were going to put uh, a bracelet to on Bagos' ankle. So Ivorian was so upset, they took on the social media. 
and then some put bananas uh, on, the, on the ankles, some other people put uh, uh, toilet paper, some other one put some drones, they show that people can ridicule the international court to the point that the French media, they didn't have any other choice but to report that, and it went viral. So people were taken to the streets uh, in The Hague, uh, during snow, sleet, sun, sunny weather. People were organizing the media, and then this is how they could not continue any longer, and then Babu was going to be acquitted. Uh, there were those three judges. Uh, the one who took the decision from Italy, Kuno Taf, Tafuse, and the other one was Anderson, the black one you see was from, uh, from uh, Trinidad, and the other lady, Kabusha, she was the one who was the dissenting voice. So briefly, this is what I wanted to say. If you have any question, let's have an interactive conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. You can join the... Yeah, I can. Are there any questions or comments? Am I the first yeah. one? Oh. Hello? All right, what do I do? Okay. Well, during your discussion yesterday and today, um, I was wondering about uh, Gaddafi. Um, I'm wondering because apparently he, he was trying to warn the rest of Africa that there was going to be a new wave of imperialism, and I believe he was interested in, in developing a different currency, either that or going with the euro. Um, could you comment on how the West views him? I don't know if he was ever um, indicted or whether at, in the International Criminal Court. So, um, Gaddafi, uh, for those of you who do not know Gaddafi, uh, he was the leader of uh, Libya. He's been in power for, he was in power for 42 years. My voice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. People can hear me. No, 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 they'll be here. I don't, okay, no problem. You know, you, you, it's a sensitive device. Okay. So, um, he was in power for 42 years, and then he wanted, uh, towards the end of his life, to be replaced by his son. I think it's Saif or El Latif or something like that. That was his name. But for some reason, he never had time to do the transfer of power, and then there was a rebellion that started in Benghazi. The US, uh, again, uh, thought that they need to go and support what they call democracy, supported the rebels, uh, many of them were affiliated with Al Qaeda. Gaddafi, uh, in that time, because, and it's a great question, because I talk about that here in this book. Uh, like I said, I have to do something short so that we can have an interactive conversation. So the ICC wanted to go after Gaddafi during the crisis. And then they were, this, like what they do, they were threatening him. Oh, yeah, we will take you to the ICC, we take you to the ICC. And now uh, Cameron, the British Prime Minister, on the French leader, all of them, and even Hillary Clinton made some, some, some serious and strange comment about Gaddafi's soldiers as people who were, you know, excuse me, because that is a public conversation that they were using Viagra uh, to go and rape women. So all those things were lies, and they said all those things in order uh, to do a character assassination, and they did the same thing with Babu, saying that Babu was accused, you know, I did not even mention war crimes, even rape, they even used that. So, Gaddafi, uh, uh, I usually do not talk about Gaddafi the way I talk about, I talk about Kwame Nkrumah. Gaddafi was a controversial leader. He brought wars in the name of a revolution that he wanted to export. He brought wars to many African countries. Chad is one of them. Even the rebellion in my country, when the rebels were looking for money, 
Gaddafi was one of the backers, one of the people who founded the rebellion. But he's an African leader. Mm -hmm. And he does not deserve to be killed the way he was killed by the international order. And I opposed that yesterday, and I denounced that, like, uh, what's the name? Uh, David Hoyle, uh, the other, uh, the, uh, Stephanie Mopas, the journalist uh, who works with the French, uh, French newspaper. So they describe all those things. And uh, when Gaddafi died, now the ICC went after his son, who was supposed to be his uh, successor. And then he was captured uh, by the rebels. And later on, they freed him. Now, as soon as Gaddafi died, and then the people were saying, oh, you know what, we want to take Gaddafi to the ICC, they did not want uh, to take his son to the International Criminal Court because he was going to divulge so many things. And then later on, they dropped the case. And he wanted to run for president. It did not happen. So, and, uh, so he was trying to do uh, a currency. He wanted to build the African International Monetary Fund. He supported the launching of a satellite by providing $400 million uh, that the Europeans promised to give to Africa for 15 years, and they never did, they never provided their funds. So uh, I did not read what I'm going to tell you, but I heard, it seemed to be credible, that Hillary Clinton wrote in a book that the reason why they went after Gaddafi it is because he wanted to create an African currency. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Are there other questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, for sharing this information. And I wonder what the African countries are doing to resist this trend. I I agree with you very much that the um, multilateral system is being abused for regime change purposes, suiting the interests of the United States and the NATO countries. But, and I'm very encouraged by the fact that so many of the African countries have not um, adopted this. Oh, sorry. I'm very encouraged by the fact that many of the, uh, almost all of the African countries are not following NATO's line on the war in Ukraine. And I find, uh, yeah, I find that encouraging. So I wonder if they're also doing something to resist this blatantly racist trend in the ICC uh, prosecutions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, so the situation, usually when I talk, I, I even say that in, uh, when I talk to people, it is not easy to be, to be a black person. And it is not easy to be an African. It is not easy to be an African leader. And then my job is to share some, some information with people. I denounce the African leaders. If you have the opportunity to read the book, you will see that. There are things that Babu that we talk about did that I did not agree with. So I have denounced that. But when you see the thing that I put on the, on the board there, I did not have time to read uh, what I wrote in the, in the book. It is, listen, when they come after you, and I know you know you're a cultured person, when they go after you, the media. Go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 I said, go ahead, let's go. I'm serious. I'm serious. It's a question, it's a comment. Go ahead. I will go back to what she's saying. Let's go. Cindy? What um, concerns me is something that Kurt told me last time we had this discussion. Um, and Kurt and I probably have a difference, but I want to ask this question because I think Kurt uh, uh, said, brought up the question, but isn't the International Criminal Court a good idea? And is it, I think he was telling me, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kurt, that it is reformable. Look. Is it? That's one question. It's my opinion that as long as it's controlled by the white European powers, it is not reformable. But I think that the two of us differ about that. And so I want to ask you, both of you, that question. Is it reformable? Before you answer, yeah. let me finish before. Uh, yeah, 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 okay, no problem. Yeah, so it is not easy. And then uh, there is, a, there is a, is, is a set of economic ties, economic uh, ties that Africa, uh, the Caribbean, and the Pacific have uh, with uh, the Europeans. 
Latin American. Yes, yeah, but yeah, uh, yes, but really with those two, those yeah. three groups. Uh, it is called uh, uh, the the Samoa Agreement. It was transformed recently into uh, the Samoa Agreement. It used to be called the Cotonou Agreement, and there was a time that it was called the Lobe Conventions or the Yaoundé Conventions. My friends, if you have the opportunity to go and read about that. People think that the African problem is about the military bases, or it is about the currency. But this one, it is more pernicious than you can imagine. They signed treaties with African countries. It was the initiative, again, of France. For later on, they were going to be followed by England, as they wanted to build a kind of commonwealth, brought the, the, the colonies, which were not independent yet, when the European Union was, going to, was created in 1957. De Gaulle was the leader of France. And they sign, they go to Kerr, let's do the agreement. They do military, economic, everything that you have under your soil. The, pref the, the, the preferential uh, commercial agreement that you can have, it has to be with France first. Mm. They did that. Now, that Cotonou agreement, why I'm talking about it? 48 African countries are members of the Cotonou agreement, now Samoa agreement. In 2005, the Cotonou Agreement adapted to new realities, criminal matters. Mm -hmm. And they tell you, if you want to be a good uh, student or a good country with good behavior in the Cotonou Agreement, boy. Yeah, what? A good boy. Okay, if you want to be a good boy, you have to sign the what? The ICC, and you have to be a part of the ICC. And over there, the European, they have the European uh, like a fund, they give money, and they're going to use that one as a blackmail, just to give you an example. This is how, you know, they, 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 they kept many African countries at bay in the Cotonou Agreement about the ICC. Now, of course, many African countries, they have different allegiances. Some, the Francophone ones, they say they control like many of them like puppets uh, by the friends, uh, by, by friends. So when there is a crisis, and because the Ivory crisis was a serious one, I've, Africa was divided. That is the truth. So for people to come together as one, they have to be a sense of what common purpose. But usually, they are divided. So this is all the thing that uh, weakened uh, the Africans. But the African expresses their voice. South Africa, Burundi, many of those countries, you know, they opposed the ICC. The African Union even was about to, to do like a collective withdrawal from the ICC. I think it was in 2013. They had all those debates. Uh, so I covered that. Many great authors covered those things. and. Uh, so the streets, in the case of Babu, it was the people, regular people uh, like myself, like you guys, who were speaking, attacking the, the Europeans. And when they realized that what they were doing was not sustainable, this is how they feel the guy. The guy is 77, old, tired, sick. They released him, and he's not reposed. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I, I wanted to just add some context also with what Nagaka said. Uh, you know, when we're talking about the quote unquote, you know, the white or Euro European powers exercising uh, control of the ICC, what's interesting is uh, most countries in Africa are member states of the ICC, the International Criminal Court. The irony is that the United States, Russia, China, India, Thank you. Israel, and one or two, uh, I think there's Yemen and Qatar, and are the only countries that are not member. member states. And the United States actually didn't even sign the original Treaty of Rome that Nagaka re referenced when he was, when he was up there talking, uh, that created the ICC. Uh, so it, it's a, it, it, do I believe in reform? I do believe in reform. I think things can be reformed. But when you have some of the biggest players in the world uh, that are not participating, 
it's it's gonna it's gonna be a difficult reform. And again, you know, when we were trying to come up with this idea back in the mid '90s uh, of coming up with this you know this court to stop these ad hoc uh, tribunals when something bad would happen, you know, internationally, whether it was in Rwanda, whether it was in Nazi Germany, whether it was in Yugoslavia, we wanted to create something that was permanent. And we wanted these rules and regulations written down so that you don't have a person like Hermann Goering during the uh, Nuremberg trials saying, you don't have jurisdiction over me because these rules you're creating, you're creating them during the actual court case. There's nothing put in writing beforehand. So therefore, we didn't commit the Nazis. We didn't commit any crimes. So we, we, what we were trying to work on is trying to avoid that type of a defense on the part of uh, potentially, you know, s some of these these perpetrators, the objective was not to create, you know, a situation where all the perpetrators were black African. Yeah. You know, I mean, there were. I can probably think of at least one or two other people in the last 30 years that were not nice in the international community that were not from Africa. You know, at least one or two. So one or two. Right, right. I'm joking, obviously. Right. So. Uh, so I think I think reform is possible, but damn, it's going to be v extremely difficult, especially with what Nagaka is showing on uh, you know on the screen here, in terms of the the makeup of who's been prosecuted. So I think another question. So uh, one thing I think that I think uh, the the United States they signed the treaty, but they did not ratify it. They did not ratify it. They signed it, right. but they did not ratify it. And then during the conversations. Uh, to create the International Criminal Court. Uh, it, you know, the, many people, they wanted to please the U.S. because the U.S. is the biggest player. They wanted to please the U.S. Even the first prosecutor, Ocampo, from Argentina, who was uh, selected, he studied, I believe, in the United States. So they thought that by positioning uh, Ocampo with like, a, a U.S. Uh, a trained uh, lawyer, uh, maybe they were going to have the favor of the United States. And then Stephanie Mopas, the French lady I was talking about, she described that story in, in her book. Uh, guess what? After people thought that uh, you know they gave all the concession to the U.S., the U.S. signed it but did not ratify it from 1998 till today. And uh, even Obama came. Uh, yeah, I spoke about that. They went like the American president. They have different ways of dealing with the ICC. Uh, Bush definitely went against uh, the ICC and even threatened any country in the world that was going to, to somehow abide by the rules of the International Criminal Court. Uh, Clinton, was there before Clinton, Clinton somehow seemed to have supported it, did not ratify it. Bush came and fought against it. Trump, uh, before Trump, <laughs> the book from Obama came, somehow uh, used his diplomacy, did not ratify the treaty. And uh, our beloved friend, Donald Trump, came, and then he, he even wanted to dismantle the UN. So that's it. So, so it can so be reflected. I, I think also yeah. that the UN, I mean, the UN, the United Nations has the same, it's like it's a copy of, you know, or at least the International Criminal Court has the same problem as the United Nations. Uh, uh, as the nation, yeah. because the United Nations has a certain number of uh, countries that can, like France, you know, uh, 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 the Security uh, Council, Security right. Council, yes, sponsor a resolution against a rebellious country, for example, in Africa or in Africa. So, I mean, the the worm is in the fruit. So I think, and then I don't I don't believe in uh, international justice unless all the countries are treated equally. So it's, it's difficult. I don't know if reform will help unless the Western world accept to uh, uh, come down from their pedestal. So I mean, I just wanted to add a quick point uh, as to why the United States never ratified the Treaty of Rome, as Nagaka said. So we have two reasons that we, you know, uh, expound in the public. One is that uh, the belief is that the the charter of the you know the, of the Treaty of Rome and ICC, uh, the creation of the ICC, uh, violates the Constitution of the United States because it creates a court that's higher than our Supreme Court in the prosecution of individuals that are American. 
So that's, that's one reason. So Americans should not be tried in courts outside of the United States. And the ultimate arbiter of decisions regarding the lives and the freedom of Americans is the United States Supreme Court, not an international law. Which is a matter of sovereignty, no. right? <laughs> yeah, and I'm, and I'm, I'm sorry, Eric. And then the, the, second, the second reason, I, and I'm, this is, I'm parapha paraphrasing a, a quote from Hillary Clinton when she, uh, when she was Secretary of State under President Obama uh, as to why the United States did not participate in the ICC uh, was she said something to the effect that the United States is in a special role in the world, that uh, we can't place our military leaders and uh, soldiers in a position where they could be prosecuted by an international body because we are always on the side of good. And at the time, I'm, 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 yeah. It's just true what he said. Yeah, so, and, and even at the time, perhaps things may not look good for a potential perpetrator who's, you know, who's been identified for prosecution. But that person, uh, in the context of history, will be essentially exonerated. So our, we're always on the side of good. It's just that it, people may not realize that at a certain time. So that was, believe it or not, a second reason why we are not a member state of the ICC. Is that gentleman over there? Yeah. The first question. Yeah, so I, I appreciate this context for the ICC. And the question that popped in my mind and it really was actually when you said that it made sense to basically have a framework for having rules and laws that people have to adhere to before they get into situations where you have to try them. Um, sorry, and, and my question is, who's in charge of enforcement? How does it basically, how do you get away from basically creating this structure, which in theory seems like a good idea, and actually get into enforcement, which as we've seen is playing out in a way that isn't necessarily favorable to justice. So maybe just breaking those, those two apart in response to your statement. So, I mean, I'm just gonna give you my opinion and then Sandy Nagaka can, you know, put, it, put in their, you know, their two cents. My, my belief is that a lot of this comes down to money. Uh, the people being targeted who have primarily been of African origin, whether it's North Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa, simply don't have the money and resources to, and, and the military firepower behind them to protect themselves compared to someone in Eastern Europe who may have committed, you know, obviously not in hit the person who his book is about, but other individuals who may have committed the same type of crime and the jurisdiction of the court would apply to them. We're, we, the court will not touch these people because of the money and the backing that they have that unfortunately Africa doesn't have, historically speaking. So that's my, one of my you know, reasons why I think that's, that's the case. Cynical, I mean, but it shows that there is a different level of standard. Absolutely, no, no doubt, no yeah, double, doubt. Double standard. No doubt. So many questions, the one in the back of you wrote first, I think. Yes? Thank you. Um, I am interested to know uh, in terms of the effect of civil and administrative law historically in the range of African countries, in what the view is about restitution and how harm is valued and the expectations of the international community to actually provide restitution. What do you mean by restitution? Yeah. Well, what I mean is if you're bringing people to trial numerous times and then they are exonerated, that brings up a question of the legitimacy of process and it also means, I guess, a question of when I say harm to the legitimacy of countries and their status, which 
as we're saying, not only financially may not be able to bring you know, resources because of privatization, but then where is the equity in restoration? Is there a process to really look at restitution for the harm of basically the legitimacy and sovereignty uh, and actualized resources that those countries actually produce. I, I think what you're talking about, it seems to me, is a civil process. If you're right. Like, well, and I guess that's a question right, right. in relation to uh, the countries that are harmed. Are there, is there, in making restitution, a means of having a civil process? I honestly don't know that, really. Um, all I know is a little bit about this, which is the criminal court, which is essentially different, which provides more criminal penalties for people who are prosecuted and convicted. I, I don't know if that even happened with Milosevic. He, of course, died in prison. Um, but I think what you're talking about is civil actions maybe like reparations that might happen in this country for slavery, but that's two kinds of different courts. There's a civil courts and then the criminal court. And what we're saying today is the criminal court. And as far as I know, there's no restitution that comes through a criminal court. Yeah. I mean, if I'm not, uh, miss, I mean, it's a great question that you're asking. I mean, if I'm understanding it correctly, you know, when we have situations when someone is wrongfully convicted, they spend, you know, in this case, you know, Dr. Lawrence spent, he spent three years in prison, right? Okay. In, or or yeah, in eight, detainment? Eight, yeah, 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 eight years in, in, the, in the eight. Right. So is that the restitution you're talking about? You know, who help, who pays for this guy's loss? You know, well, and not only his way. loss, but the loss of leadership. Yeah. And yeah. what people have accumulated actually in the leadership, which affects obviously the financial worth of a, a country, its valuation of its resources, the natural resources, and how those are brought to you know, valuation. So that's also the question, not only to this one person, but you know, to the harm of dignity of the representation of the value of those countries. Uh, I, I mean, it's 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 a great point. I, I I don't think you know. I don't think there is such. A process. I don't think there's such a, a process. I mean, you know, could the former leader of of Ivory Coast file an action in the International Court of Justice for a claim? Yes, this is the ICJ, not the ICC, right. International Court of Justice. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if there's any precedent for that for the loss of the resources of the country, you know, the people of that country, and then, of course, the individual whose life was interrupted like Thank this. You want to yeah, yes. No, okay, but, but anyway, you guys gave some, you know, great answers already. Yeah, so there is no uh, process for restitution. And then uh, when I went to Atlanta a couple of years ago, uh, there was a, another beautiful white uh, American soul the people were attacking, you know, supporting what the ISIS was doing. And she raised the question that, you, that some of you raised. She said, but the guy was sent to prison for eight years. And she said, imagine in America that they put somebody in prison for eight years. They have done that. Like, like no bailout for 13 times denied. That there will be an outcry in America. But because he's black and African, it's okay. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. There is no. And um, the Bemba from Congo was also in, in prison. And when he wanted to ask for restitution, it was just rejected. So there was no even conversation about it. Okay. Um, can I say something, though? Many of our prisoners in this country who are black but also white, they are wrongfully convicted, even of murders. And they're on death row even for years. There's no real process. There are, I suppose, a wrongful conviction perhaps could get a little bit of money, but it's not usual. Um, many innocent people I, uh, go to jail here for a very long time, and there's virtually nothing that can repair that. 
But I would like to add something in, in the case of Gbagbo. Gbagbo was sent to prison because the US, France, and the European countries wanted the new guy to be able to, you know, uh, to be in power without any problem or disruption. So he was kept over there as long as he would take for the new guy who was groomed at the IMF, uh, 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 almost came to power in the, you know, tanks, in the tanks of uh, the, the French, you know, army, who was there, who was the, uh, the guy responsible for uh, putting in place all the structural adjustment policies from the IMF. So he, he, he is the guy, a good boy of the Western world. So for this good boy to be there without any disruption, Babu was kept. If we would have taken 10 or 20 years for Alassane Ouattara to be able to govern with no problem, securing oil, uh, cacao, and all these resources for the US and the European, he would have stayed there. They don't care about you know, uh, you know <laughs> any reparation. And the Robin, Robin, yeah, Robin, she's been waiting for a year, yeah. for, oh. for, for hours. Yeah. Yeah. For eight yeah. years. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I want to let uh, Monsieur Ganaka know that here in Vermont, we have had an effort to bring a criminal to justice, and that is George Bush. Okay. And the person who uh, pioneered and uh, carried that effort forward, ran for statewide office. I was her campaign manager. She's here with us today, and I'd like her to tell everyone about it. Wow, <laughs> that's my friend. <laughs> oh, thanks for remembering that, Robin. Well, come on, it was very important. Well, uh, it was. It was important because a book had come out by the famous criminal trial lawyer, Vincent Bugliosi, and it was titled, The Prosecution of George W. Bush for Murder. Okay, see, I, well, I, I, I mean, that title in itself, I mean, his wife was concerned that he had that title because it's very provocative. But he showed a way that Bush could be prosecuted even in the state court. Um, and even though, um, he did not personally, you know, shoot um, victims in Iraq. He, he studied it intensely. And, and to make a short story even shorter, um, I picked up on it. And it was all Robin's fault. She said, there's this book that says that you can actually prosecute him in a state court. And so uh, I read, I started reading it, and I was very intrigued. And I was already running for attorney general under the progressive ticket. But because of that um, comment by Robin, I started to explore it more. End result was we had a campaign centered in Robin's house. That was our campaign headquarters. And the only thing is that it, it got off the ground really late. You know, it was in September, and the uh, elections were in November. But Vermont was very hostile to Bush. Okay. And in the southern part of Vermont, there was an effort, a, a grassroots effort, that, that they would arrest him if he even crossed state lines. So, so we, thought, we thought if we got enough groundswell going, uh, I might actually get elected. And the reason that didn't happen, apart from the late start, is after my first announcement, uh, and I had Bugliosi next to me. It got a lot of press coverage, and then the press just completely silenced our campaign. So I found out later there were people all over the state that said, if we knew that you were running on that platform, we would have voted for you. So the role of the media is incredibly important in either advancing a cause or preventing it. That's funny. Thank you. Yeah. Meg Gunn. Hello. Um, my question is about the future of these kind of movements of leaders from the African youth. And I'm curious if you know much about the political education of African youth about Pan-Africanism, about changing this national order, and also even like African youth who are living here in America. Like what, what kind of things are 
the youth learning, like history wise and gathering together to make any changes, if you know. Yeah, so yeah, there is a, something is happening. I yesterday I spoke about that a bit. Something is happening in Africa. So uh, mm. when uh, the crisis erupted 2010, 2011, I had just finished my uh, PhD. I was looking for a job. I was even thinking that I could get a job at the UN. Uh, and then when uh, it became serious, somebody had to do what I did. We were not many, and Eric can tell, the raft of the American power. Listen, and some Obama, when he, when he speaks, the entire universe listens. Hillary Clinton, all of them. So when I was invited at the Voice of America, they asked me questions several times. Everyone has spoken, but what do you have to say? But I, I, I even talked about that in the beginning, like uh, inspired by Dr. King. I believe I was convinced that this uh, ICT thing that we were going to win. And then, for based on some other factors that I cannot mention here, and then we did it. Speaking to small gatherings, three, four, five people. I paid my ticket with my partner's money, going to Namibia 24 hours to go and speak to like 20, 25 people. I went to The Hague. I was the only Ivorian there. And then more than 100 people, most of them trying to support the ICC. And then we did it step by step. But I was convinced that we were going to win. But I was not, even though we were not many, but we were not, I was not alone, of course. So, uh, Paolo Coelho said, one of my favorite authors, like the old the alchemist, that when you are pursuing your personal legend, the universe conspires to make it happen. So at the Hague, the only Ivorian, I met beautiful people like Sandy, Robin, my wonderful friend there, Megan, Kurt, and step by step, like in the Bible, when the Bible talks about the dry bones coming together and then we, our position became the dominant position in the conference at The Hague. Same thing in Ghana, where I confronted the prosecutor of the ICC. So uh, people like that exist, they just need to meet. And that's why we do what we are doing. And then at the same time as we were doing that, I know people who are scholars, they want to be in some amphitheaters, small rooms and talk. But I, I became scholar afterwards. I am a, an activist. I am a politician. I had my PhD 2009, not too long ago. So I love to be speaking to communities. And then, because of what the French did, because of the way they bombed the president of a sovereign country, Megan, too young to see that, even the people who did not like him, they were so offended that they decided that they had to do something. So uh, it was a blessing in disguise. They thought that by bombing and taking a president, and then what they did to him, that was exactly what happened to an African leader in 1961 called Patrice Dumumba. Many others. No, no, but particularly, you know, the way they arrested him. Yeah. And the way, yeah, but the way they arrested him is like something that happened like 50 years ago. People said, no. So they are helping us by killing Gaddafi. Despite everything Gaddafi did that was not good, so they are helping us as the people. There is a reawakening of the African people. And then there are, like, like I told you, the, in France, when people were debating, you will not believe it. White people, they say, no, we can't be like that. Stephanie Bopas, she is a French lady working for the French media, and she wrote a book to denounce what the Europeans were doing. So it is happening. People are in the, just say, people are in the streets in Mali, mm -hmm. in, in Mali, in Burkina Faso against the French military bases. The Babos case like, contributed to the revival of Pan-Africanism 
and it is happening. And then we are doing what we can do. We need to do better, but we, it is happening. That's why I'm here. Uh, I'm happy to have met all these people like you. That's my answer. Yes. About the youth, there is a movement that is being helped by the social media. Journalism is key. I was a former reporter. I covered the war for CNN over there, and I saw everything. I went there. I thought, like, like a journalist, you know, there's no... I went, I tried to not do like an American journalist, who's the bad guy, who's the good guy. I went there, I thought like everything was clear, and then I realized what was happening. So there's not much access to journalism. The debate on mainstream is, uh, is controlled by uh, France, the US, CNN, blah, blah, blah. Now, thanks to the social media, there's a movement that is going on. But this movement, unfortunately, has, I mean, has to be fed with facts, history. They need to learn because, you know, even the, uh, the, uh, the criminal court and the Western world, the Western imperialist world can, can work on the algorithm to make you believe that you are, you know, doing like you are fighting against them. But you know you're gonna you know go around you know, with false information. So it's important that the youth of the Western world also join this uh, this fight. Because I came here, I have a lot of friends that are progressive here, but you know they don't have the real information, and then they read everything through the lenses of CNN, through the lenses of the progressive media here. CNN is a fraud. I've been there. You know CNN is a fraud. Uh, most of them are frauds. And then the way journalism is done here is like you have to s have your side. It's either, you know, uh, um, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, uh, Fox News or MSNBC, nothing in the middle. No dialectic. So we need in Vermont to, to, to teach critical thinking based on the real fact. And you guys not have to know that these phony flags and phony independences that you see from Africa is all. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Sally, I would like to say one thing before. Uh, so one the reason why uh, my, in the beginning, the title I put here was not the, it wasn't the title, as I've been working on the book for several uh, years. But I really started writing the book, like, let's say, four or five years ago. So uh, because uh, many people think that Pan-Africanism is like is a dead idea. Many people think that you know Pan-Africanism or Pan-Africanists cannot claim victories, and it's because people don't know. So it happened, like the civil rights movement, uh, the decolonization of Africa, the end of the apartheid movement. I mentioned all those things here. So these are victories won by Pan-Africanists and by internationalists. In the case of the ICC here, listen, my friend. I say, when I say 10 years, 10 years, or maybe nine, eight or nine years, people did it. If you go, I wish, maybe when Eric wants to do oh, a, 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 docu no, no, a documentary, you can see people going to The Hague. Uh, some black Americans, some whites, many Africans from different nationalities. I'll show you a couple of things on the social media. They took the social media. There is a, a story I told you, very funny. People were doing all those things. And then youth involved. And then people from different nationalities. And then this, by worst case, it is a Pan-African victory in order to answer that segment of your question about Pan-Africanism. So people are emboldened. If Babu can be freed from the ICC, then it is possible for us to win more victories. And this is the mindset today of the people who are organizing in the streets of Africa, <laughs> uh, from Madagascar to Morocco, uh, from Addis Ababa to Abidjan. Uh, I just want to uh, respond to what our friend Eric here was saying about how the ICC worked with allowing um, multinational corporations to come in and do extractivist pro projects for the benefits of Europeans, not necessarily the people of the country. I just wanted to mention that um, the ICC is not the only tool for doing this. The old tools in the toolbox are still there. And we have a case going on right now with Peru. Peru, which is notorious for having um, 
unstable presidents and lots of prosecutions for corruption and notorious for being very slow in processing these. Well, when an ind indigenous school teacher was, tr was elected as president of the country and they wanted to get rid of him, within one day they were able to you know, arrest him and put him in jail and remove him from office. And there have been many criticisms of Pedro Castillo, this president, but one thing that he was doing, there were 30 extractivist projects that he was not signing and not letting to go through. And, you know, the U.S. Uh, ambassador, former CIA agent, had uh, spoken with the Peruvian military the day before he was deposed, and now they're sending, you know, 600 U.S. troops to train there, and all these extractivists activist projects are going through. So um, this, is, this is an old playbook with new, the imperialism has endless creativity for foisting new forms on us. Thank you. Please, I would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, a friend, my brother actually, who came from Canada, Montreal, to follow that discussion. He just arrived, Leopold Lagnero. Uh, thank you for being here. Okay. So you can go ahead. Yeah. Well, I can't resist mentioning the, the extractive in, industries. Um, my father died in a plane crash in Ethiopia when I was an infant, and he had just come off a top secret mission to Saudi Arabia. And um, later on as an adult and as a journalist, I, uh, I wanted to find out what was behind that. He was America's first master spy in the Middle East. I've done FOIA, I've, I've sued the CIA, I've gotten his, a lot of his papers, and I ended up finding a theme that ran through the story of his death right up to the present. The theme, which is the title of my book, is called Follow the Pipelines. Okay. So, so it's in the book. Ta-da! Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Follow the Pipelines. <laughs> Unla uncovering the mystery of a lost spy and the deadly politics of the great game for oil. And, and so I, I just want to say, I mean, it was amazing to me. Back then, 47, uh, it was the Trans-Arabian pipeline that was causing all sorts of uh, interest and even consternation because what it did is it elevated the U.S. into being a major power, not only in the Middle East but in the world. And then you follow, and then there was great resentment, even from our allies. The French, the British, and the Russians were all really concerned that the U.S. got this exclusive concession in Saudi oil. And, and so there were, you know, all sorts of intrigue is associated with oil. Now, taking it right up to the present, I've written stories about, in fact, right after the invasion of Ukraine, I wrote a story about how I saw this as possibly the mother of all energy wars, which I think it is. I think it's so blatant, it's so obvious now, they can't hide it. Because once the Nord Stream 2 pipeline was attacked, uh, um, they began to, uh, and this was feeding natural gas to Europe, you know, great concern, where are we gonna find more, more natural gas and oil? And uh, it's still going on today. This is why efforts at climate, uh, prevent, <laughs> preventing climate change have been um, delayed because of this concern that they can't get their hands on enough natural gas and oil. And the reason why I emphasize oil among all the other natural resources is because it's the fuel of the military. And, and the theme I have found out 70 years is that if you aspire to be a great power, then you have to secure your fuel supplies. And even if you don't need to secure them now, you may need to secure them later so the other guys don't get it. And to me, this is what the Ukraine war is about. The whole eastern part of Ukraine, the Donbass region, is where the richest, um, reserves of natural gas yet to be exploited, mind you, in Europe are in the Donbass. It never gets discussed. Oil is censored out of discussion continuously. But there you have it. And, and, and to overcome that, however, is, is the young people 
have caught on. They see oil as the, the enemy. They are out there with, in their demonstrations about the evil energy company, uh, companies causing climate change. And so there is the momentum for connecting generations around an issue that confronts all of it, not only war and endless wars, but climate disasters. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I just add a point, and I, I think uh, yes, in, the, in the case of Africa, I mean, you're talking about some of the richest reserves of rare earth metals uh, that are Right. The foundation of you know our our what we want you know our new economy to be uh, you know we talk about uh, the the rechargeable batteries for vehicles and you know they're highly reliant on lithium you know lithium is uh, it, it does for whatever reason it doesn't you know occur you know in our ground in in Europe and the United States it's always usually in <laughs> developing countries just by chance and. You know, countries and c corporations are often in a position to have to exploit, you know, the politics of, of those countries. And they take sides and they want leaders who give them specifically concessions to the detriment of the local people that live there often. You know, and it's, and it's you know, and uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know your name, but you made the comment that it's an old playbook. Uh, that's being revisited. I mean, these issues were happening and happening all the time in Africa, in you know colonial times, and even in the 1950s, you know, where Nagaka talked about these leaders being forced to sign agreements with these you know multinationals and with the governments of you know of different countries in Europe. People have friendlier faces now, you know, but the game, the playbook is the same. Yeah. Thank you. And, and now there's a new uh, dawn, like China, Russia are major players on the continent. I would like, you know, uh, Nyaka to uh, uh, <laughs> touch that subject because uh, now uh, when I was, I also had uh, been a consultant, um, a communication consultant for the African Union when I, I left uh, Burlington uh, 10 years ago. Uh, I went there and then at uh, one of uh, the uh, uh, annual meetings, uh, Mugabe, Robert Mugabe, who used to be the president of, uh, he's dead now, uh, of uh, um, Zimbabwe, who, was the same, who has had the same problem. He was a good boy until uh, the British prime minister and uh, uh, um, um, uh, Clinton, you know, deceived him. They said, we're going to help you try to get back some of the lands from, uh, from uh, you know, Zimbabwe to the black farmers in Zimbabwe because 90%, even more, maybe, of the lands, arable lands, were in the possession of the white farmers. Uh, Tony Blair and Clinton didn't do that. He had the pressure from his people. He had to nationalize some of these lands. So Mugabe was also, you know, a pariah. But at one meeting in uh, Addis Ababa, I remember vividly, he said, you know, uh, 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 the European used to rape us. Now China, we, we can, with China, we can choose to go to bed with China. This was literally his words. Because, you know, there's no rape here. So how do you think that, you know, because me, as someone who has been, you know, trained in the US, my daughters are from here. I love this country very much. And I hope that I can push the leadership of this country to revisit the way they do business with Africa. So, so we can secure, you know, a, 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 a good relationship. I grew up with a, a portrait of uh, JFK in my house. My father wouldn't wear any other shoes but Florentine shoes. So um, je suis un petit américain. So, so how can we, you know, make sure that you know, uh, in this battle over there, people don't go from one master to another one, which could be Pékin, or we could be uh, 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 the Kremlin. Okay. So I know. Uh, uh, people love to talk about, uh, you know, the rise of China in Africa, and then the comeback uh, of uh, Russia in Africa, 
and then the forceful uh, engagement of the West in Africa, and then under the title of the name of the New Scramble for Africa. Uh, the only thing that we want, sometimes uh, it is becoming a debate. People think uh, that Africans want to, to distance themselves from the United States, from France, and from England, and then they want to go and side with Russia or, or, or China. The same debate happened like 50 years ago in the context of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And then they saw, uh, like, there was a conference uh, for the African student, by uh, Pan African student movement. So in Kampala, 1958, I think July 7th to July 8th. And there was a young girl, she said, we, we don't even care about the Cold War, but we don't understand why America is so obsessed with the Cold War. The only thing we want, we just want food and shelter and then education, the same thing today. So it is not that people love uh, Russia or China. Uh, when we were fighting for independence, they were on our side. Uh, when America and the French and the, the British, when they made sure that Mandela goes to prison for 27 years, those who were fighting to end apartheid were Russia, China, and particularly, particularly Cuba. These are historical facts. But here, people do not want to remember. And that's why they're so uh, upset that they cannot rally the world around uh, a movement against Russia. But these are historical facts. When I talk about the BRICS countries, uh, something that I love to say that I forgot to talk about yesterday. The BRICS, could we tell us? The BRICS, no, I'm talking about something that I have an argument that I forgot to. No, who are the BRICS? Yeah, we say, we say that. BRICS are Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. They came together. And then they created like a new paradigm of, on international development in order somehow to promote themselves and to counter uh, the dominance of the Britain Woods institutions, which are IMF and the World Bank and so and so. What the British countries are bringing to Africa is not like they've brought wealth in Africa. No, not yet. We don't, they have not brought wealth. They have not brought some particular development besides what China is doing. But what the British countries uh, bring to Africa, it is the power of choice mm -hmm. that you were talking about in, Mug in the Mugabe's vulgar language, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it is the power of choice. Uh, and then we can choose, you know, to go and get money from the International Development Bank put together by the BRICS banks and controlled by China. And then all we can go to the IMF. Now, if you want to go to the IMF, what they've been doing for years is that, OK, America has a new agenda. Uh, in the past, uh, we want uh, to give you money, but you need to privatize you know, your state companies. If you don't do that, we are not going to give you money. When there was the issue of the International Criminal Court, they did the same thing. Like Kurt said, if they have not ratified the treaty, and they will make sure that you go to the ICC. They have not ratified the ICC treaty, but America provided the support to not to go and arrest people in Sudan in different parts, or the French do that. That was the ICC. And now the new conversation is, and I'm just giving you information, it is about uh, gay rights. Mm -hmm. So gay rights, same-sex marriage. So we respect uh, anyone. If you want, somebody wants to be homosexual, this is your freedom. No one is going to go and interfere in your sexuality. But to see the American leaders go into African countries to push people to make sure that people put gay marriage in their respective constitutions, if you don't do that, they will not give you money. Come on. Seriously? Seriously. And now, uh, 
They went to talk to uh, Uhuru Kenyatta. Even Obama went there to talk. The current president who was just elected, same conversation, same conversation with the president of Senegal, Macky Sall. Uh, same conversation everywhere. Now, Ghana seemed to be opposing uh, that. And now Ghana wants some money from the IMF, to two or three billions. And because it does, uh, Ghana does not know uh, white people, so the president came, you know, Ghana beyond aid. You know, we want to be free. OK. And then he has not changed the structure of the economy of Ghana. And then the multinationals are exploiting the resources to the detriment of the masses. And then coupled with uh, corruption and many other things that they were doing that, 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 that were preventing sustainable development in Ghana. Ghana needs money. Ghana started talking to the IMF till today. They have not received the money yet. But in the meantime, the conversation, oh, what is, by the way, your new position about same-sex marriage? And this is what they do. People need to know. So, uh, so that is the conversation that is happening in um, uh, Africa. Uh, it is not easy. Like I said, it is not easy to be a leader in Africa, and it is not easy uh, to be an African. But uh, we hope uh, things can change, and then uh, we are still alive. People did that before. We are doing it, meeting new people, and building a, a new momentum, building a international co a coalition so that we can attack or address different other issues. Yes, thank you. I mean, I think the other thing that's important to recognize with respect to, you know, we. We look at China in this country with a, a great deal of suspicion and skepticism, but uh, China and to a lesser extent the, uh, the BRICS countries, uh, they also, when African countries do business with them, uh, don't think that they are not remembering the fact that they don't have the horrible histories right. of colonialism and the brutality that was committed in Africa by the countries now that have smiles, but uh, you know, not everyone forgets history, and they they don't. China and the other BRICS countries, to a lesser extent, uh, don't have that history. They, you know, in, 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 on the uh, on the African con continent, you know. So uh, it's a refreshing for for countries in Africa. It's often a, a, a you know a refreshing new face on the block. Uh, because they don't have that, you know, negative connotation with respect to Western countries that, you know, that they do. Um, I, I just want to say a comment rather than a question, but um, I want to say that American people, I think, are the only people that believe we have a free press and that we are not subject to steady and endless propaganda. We actually believe that our press and our media do not propagandize us. It's the best propaganda available, mm -hmm. if you think about it, because we bought it hook, line, and sinker that we are a free country. And one of the things that I've learned, not by the mainstream media, except for a couple of people, is history. You never hear about history in our mainstream media. And I'm kind of blown away, because my office is with the Association of Africans Living in Vermont. I have been absolutely uh, given the privilege of understanding how uh, our history plays itself out in Africa, not only in Africa, but also in Latin America. And as Kurt said, the people of Latin America, the people of Africa, are, do remember and know history firsthand. And they know something that we don't know, and that is that the white European powers have been the main colonialists since the dawn of capitalism in the 14th, 15th century in Europe. It is the main colonizers of the entire planet are the um, capitalist powers, let's put it that way. It's France, England, um, the United States, Germany, latecomer, and Italy, latecomers. They remember that. So when a war breaks out between the NATO powers against Russia, than those, and Russia, who has aided a lot the Third World, especially during the Cold War, in their independence struggle, those Latin Americans and Africans remember that. And there's no way, I don't think, that that 
that they, I don't think I have that opinion, that they are going to ally easily with the, native po the NATO powers in this current war. I think Americans better get hip to that, and pretty damn soon. What? I'll be really quick. Uh, to add to all those excellent points, there's also the issue of sanctions. Yes. And 40 countries are now under sanctions. I've been hearing one third of humanity and up to half of, of the people on this planet are subject to sanctions by the United States and some by European countries. Well, think that, of the ones that are under sanctions, Iran. Cuba. African countries, All though. Africa. So many African countries. Venezuela. To run. Venezuela. Russia. Russia. Russia, way China. big time. But it doesn't seem to be harming Russia that much. <laughs> Uh, I would like to make a comment here and, and want to say something a little bit that joins the issue about how young people are being educated and also, quote unquote, who are the Americans? Because, you know, in the United States, we have many people with different histories, very much tied to colonialism and the move towards understanding what decolonializing means for people who are of the global majority. And I say this particularly because um, there are some interesting intersections now, even say among American, African American community intersecting with Africans here who are students who do not want to see themselves viewed as coming through the same experience of quote unquote downtrodden, <laughs> being downtrodden here in the United States history of uh, enslavement. And yet they're also very interested in figuring out their place in the networks to be successful both economically and culturally, uh, collaboratively, what that means uh, to be distinctive. And I um, think that this is an interesting issue because when we're talking about the quote unquote free press, well, I can tell you <laughs> that many of us definitely know that the press is not free. Um, and as somebody from a multiracial background that spans five generations, um, definitely that is known. But I think that this is an interesting issue about how people are being educated because it is very difficult here in the United States, even say to start at the high school level because a lot of the history shows somehow that the leadership in Africa constantly is subject to destabilization. And what though, why that happens and how that's really understood, and like I said, that's why I asked my question before about the valuation of the resources. Because even to this day, these resources are emergent. But this affects investigation technology yeah. and the portrayal. Uh, Putin also is being indicted. What will happen? We tackled this question last time, but you know. Yeah? I saw an interesting thing about the arrest. Are you talking about the arrest warrant against Vladimir Putin? Against Vladimir Putin. South by Africa. The International Criminal Court. Right, but yeah. the South Africans invited Putin to come to South Africa. No, that, that the, if, if they did not, uh, uh, because I, I something I talk about, if the ICC was not able. Uh, right. To uh, arrest Bashi, Ma the Bashi, the former Bashir president of Sudan, Sudan. Bashir yeah. Assad. If the ICC was, because the same debate that they're having, they had the same debate about Bashi. He was supposed to go to uh, South, South Africa, I think he went. And then uh, there was, a, he was supposed to go to another country, uh, Malawi. And then, uh, and then over there, pressure on the president, Joyce Banda, the lady. 
who succeeded uh, Mutarika, and then somehow she renounced to organize, to host the African Union meeting. So they've been doing the same thing. So if they did not go and arrest Bashi, Putin is not going to be the one to be arrested. They're just doing that uh, for PR purposes. Yeah. And then as we say in Africa, they know who to uh, go back. Because the guy has a, a topic. No, <laughs> anyway, so somebody wanted to ask uh, somebody. Yes, madam. Yeah, we have uh, OK. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, I would. Um, I would like to bring forth um, today someone who's no longer with us. His name is Gary Davis. Uh, if he was here, he would have uh, many opinions. He was a uh, world citizen, and he was a world citizen because, oops, I'm tied up here. Uh, he dropped bombs on Germany and um, during his process of PTSD, recovering from that, he came to the conclusion that nation states cause war. And he did not want to be a part of a nation state. So he was, um, uh, he was a citizen of the world, and he, never, and he had no passports. He made his own passports. And I just bring this up to, to also connect to what we discussed in Quaker meeting this morning, which some of us here were there. Um, about authority. Who do we give authority to? And I think if Gary was here, he would say the nations, the, the United Nations is made up of a bunch of corrupt nations conniving together to, um, to share power and to share power amongst the powerful. What if there could be a government made up of people and uh, that would be uh, transcend boundaries. And I think it's just an idea that it's very idealistic, but the idea of every person in the world having equal representation, that would mean there would be a, a sort of a parliament that would be largely made up of Chinese people and, and Indian people and uh, maybe three or four Americans, and this would be the this would be the true power of um, democratic society a, a, of a d democratic world. So, um, just it's just a thought to think about. So, uh, uh, any further questions or thoughts? No. So. so. I guess maybe we conclude. You yes. want to your concluding words? No, no. I, I, my concluding words would be what I sort of was saying before. That it appears to me that there is a new world emerging, a new world order. Put it that way, and that the nations uh, that are on the rise, and I hope on a decent, more decent rise than the white European powers, are really focused in Africa, Latin America, and maybe parts of Asia. In other words, in the developing world. I believe that the United States should watch this carefully and decide, essentially, what side are we on? Uh, sticking with the uh, topic of the book that Nagaga wrote, uh, it's, it's quite uh, disappointing uh, I can say personally, from you know the standpoint of uh, being involved in talks about developing this new, you know, world uh, justice that we were looking to do back in the '90s, that uh, the perpetrators being prosecuted or individuals being prosecuted, you know, are unfortunately, you know, as as Nagaga's. Uh, screenshot showed are all black African. Uh, that wasn't supposed to be what we intended. We had better, uh, we had higher hopes. So it's honestly, it's just, it's disappointing. I mean, uh, that's how I'm going to end it. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. So Sandy said it. Uh, there is the, the emergence of a, a polycentric world. Uh, that the world, a polycentric world uh, was born. Uh, there is nothing the United States can do about it. Right. America can still be the most important power, but America has to acknowledge, recognize, and know that uh, China uh, is uh, like one of the biggest players today, 
uh, Russia has, has demonstrated a resilience uh, that defeated the sanctions. And then the resistance of Russia has freed uh, many countries in the world that are to, that are willing, uh, you know, to go against uh, uh, the dictat of you know the Western world. We don't want uh, war. We don't. We want the only thing we want is what justice. If people can implement justice, you know, we find if uh, the ICC can be reformed and then they can do the right thing, we don't have any problem. But. Uh, we didn't have time to talk too much about it today, but what we see in the ICC, we saw the same flaws with the Nuremberg trial, and you spoke about that when you were talking about the German who did not recognize the jurisdiction of the Nuremberg trial. Same thing happened before the Nuremberg trial with Leipzig trial in Germany, and then many other things, institutions they put together. But uh, we're not going to say that we don't want to see any institutions because victimizers need to be brought to justice. justice yeah. And the position is that we want all victimizers to be brought to justice. If you go after Vladimir Putin, listen, remember that you know there is something that you need to fix. You have to go back to George W. Bush. If we can do that, we don't have any problem with you. But if you go and take Babu and you leave the other ones, we will be there to denounce. Now, I'm going to let you go with the, my, the last uh, sentences I put in my book. I quoted a lady that if you don't know her, I would like you to follow that lady. She's from Nigeria, and her name is, she's a writer, a novelist, her name is Shimamanda Ngozi Adishie. Powerful lady. So she became very famous because she wrote a book on, a novel on feminism, and also she gave a a TED Talk in 2014, and then the title of the TED Talk is The Danger of a Single Story. The Danger, danger of a Single Story. Oh. And um, this is what she said. Stories matter. Many stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign but stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. I would like to end, this is the one talking, I would like to end with this thought, that when we reject the single story, when we realize that there is never a single story about any place, we regain a kind of paradise. That was the purpose of my book, that everything that they were saying about Babo could not be the, 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 the only truth, that there was another side, and this is what I tried to do in this book. And then, thank God, we have been vindicated by history, and then we won that Pan-African victory, and Babo was freed, and then people could see that the ICC is finally uh, a tool in the hands of the most powerful, and the ICC has been indicted before the tribunal of history. Therefore, I put the title of my book, Laurent Babo's trial and the indictment of the International Criminal Court, a Pan-African victory. Thank you very much, people. Thank you. Voilà, coffee, some refreshment as I know.